Chapter 6, The Wild Wastelands of the North. At about nine o'clock next morning, three lonely figures might have been seen picking their way across the shribble by the shoals and stepping stones. It was a shallow, noisy stream, and even Jill was not wet above her knees when they reached the northern bank. About fifty yards ahead, the land rose up to the beginning of the moor, everywhere steeply and often in cliffs. I suppose that's our way, said Scrub, pointing left and west to where a stream flowed down from the moor through a shallow gorge. But the marsh wiggle shook his head. The giants mainly live along that side of the gorge, he said. You might say the gorge was like a street to them. We'll do better straight ahead, even though it is a bit steep. They found a place where they could scramble up and in about ten minutes stood panting at the top. They cast a longing look back at the valley land of Narnia and then turned their faces to the north. The large, lonely, vast moor stretched up and on as far as they could see. On their left was rockier ground. Jill thought that it must be the edge of the giant's gorge and did not much care about looking in that direction. They set out. It was good, springy ground for walking and a day of pale winter sunlight. As they got deeper into the moor, the loneliness increased. One could hear peewits and the occasional hawk. When they halted in the middle of the morning for a rest and a drink in a little hollow by the stream, Jill was beginning to feel she might enjoy adventures after all, and said so. We haven't had any yet, said the marsh wiggle. Walks after the first halt, like school mornings after break or railway journeys after changing tra trains, never go on as they were before. When they set out again, Jill noticed the rocky edge of the gorge had drawn nearer. The rocks were less flat, more upright than they had been. In fact, they were like little towers of rock. What funny shapes they were! I do believe, thought Jill, that all the stories about giants might have come from those funny rocks. If you were coming along here when it was half dark, you could easily think those piles of rocks were giants. Look at that one now. You could almost imagine that the lump on its top was its head. It would be rather too large for the body, but it would do well enough for an ugly giant. And all that bushy stuff, I, I suppose it's heather and bird's nests, really. It would do quite well for hair and a beard. And those things sticking out of its side, quite like ears. Now, they'd be horribly big, but I dare say giants would have big ears like elephants and... Oh! Her blood froze. The thing had moved. It was a real giant. There was no mistaking it. She had seen it turn its head. She had caught a glimpse of the great stupid puff-cheeked face. All these things were giants not rocks. There were forty or fifty of them all in a row, obviously standing with their feet in the bottoms of the gorge and their elbows resting on the edge of the gorge, just as men might stand leaning on a wall, lazy men, on a fine morning after breakfast. Keep straight on, whispered Puddle Glum, who had noticed them too. Don't look at them. Whatever you do, don't run. They'd be all on us in a moment. So they kept on, pretending not to have seen the giants. It was like walking past the gate of a house where there was a fierce dog, only far worse. There were dozens and dozens of these giants. They didn't look angry, or kind, or interested at all. There was no sign they'd even seen the travelers. Then, whizz, whizz. Some heavy objects came hurtling through the air, and with a crash, a big boulder fell about twenty paces ahead of them. And then, thud! Another fell twenty feet behind. Are they aiming at us? asked Grub. No, said Puddle Glum. We'd be a good deal safer if they were. They're trying to hit that. That cairn over there to the right. They won't hit it, you know. It's safe enough. They're such very bad shots. They play cockshies most fine mornings. About the only game they're clever enough to understand. It was a horrible time. 
There seemed no end to the line of giants, and they never ceased hurling stones, some of which fell extremely close. Quite apart from the real danger, the very sight and sound of their faces and voices were enough to scare anyone. Jill tried not to look at them. After about 25 minutes, the giants apparently had a quarrel. This put it into the cockshies, but it was not pleasant to be within a mile of quarreling giants. They stormed and jeered at one another in long, meaningless words about 20 syllables each. They foamed and gibbered and jumped in their rage, and each jump shook the earth like a bomb. They lammed each other upside the head with great clumsy stone hammers, but their skulls were so hard that the hammers bounced off again, and then the monster who had given the blow would drop the hammer and howl with pain because it had stung his fingers. But he was so stupid he would do the exact same thing a minute later. This was good in the long run, for by the end of the hour all the giants were so hurt that they sat down and began to cry. When they sat down, their heads were below the edge of the gorge so that you saw them no more, but Jill could hear them howling and blubbering and boo-hooing like great babies, even after the place was a mile behind. That night, they bivouacked on a bare moor, and Puddleglum showed the children how to make the best of their blankets by sleeping back to back. The backs kept each other warm, and you can have both blankets on top. But it was chilly even so, and the ground was hard and lumpy. The Marsh Wiggle told them they would feel more comfortable if only they thought how very much colder it would be later on and further north, but this didn't cheer them up at all. They traveled across Etten's Moor for many days, saving the bacon and living chiefly on the moorfowl. They were not, of course, talking birds, which Eustace and the, and the Wiggle shot. Jill rather envied Eustace for being able to shoot. He had learned it on his voyage with King Caspian. As there were countless streams on the moor, they were never short of water. Jill thought that when, in books, people live on what they shoot, it never tells you what a long, smelly, messy job it is plucking and cleaning dead birds and how cold it makes your fingers. But the great thing was they met hardly any giants. One giant saw them, but he only roared with laughter and stumped away on his own business. About the tenth day, they reached a place where the country changed. They came to the northern edge of the moor, and looked down a long, steep slope into a different and grimmer land. At the bottom of the slope were cliffs. Beyond these, a country of high mountains, dark precipices, stony valleys, ravines so deep and narrow that one could not see far into them, and rivers that poured out of echoing gorges to plunge sullenly into black depths. Needless to say, it was Puddleglum who pointed out a sprinkling of snow on the more distant slopes. But there will be more on the north side of them, I shouldn't wonder, he added. It took them some time to reach the foot of the slope, and, when they did, they looked down from the top of the cliffs at a river running below them from west to east. It was walled in by precipices on the far side as well as on their own, and it was green and sunless, full of rapids and waterfalls. The roar of it shook the earth even where they stood. The bright side of it is, is this, said Puddleglum, that if we break our necks getting down to the cliff, then we're sure to be safe from being drowned in the river. What about that? said Scrub suddenly, pointing upstream to their left. Then they all looked and saw the last thing they were expecting. A bridge. And what a bridge, too. It was a huge single arch that spanned the gorge from cliff top to cliff top, and the crown of that arch was so high above the cliff tops as the dome of St. Paul's is above the street. Why, it must be a giant's bridge, said Jill. Or a sorcerer's, most likely, said Puddleglum. We've got to look out for enchantments in a place like this. I think it's a trap. I think it'll turn to mist and melt away just as soon as we're out in the middle of it. Oh, for goodness sakes, stopping such a wet blanket, said Scrub. Why on earth shouldn't it be a proper bridge? Do you think any of the giants we've seen would have sense to build a thing like that, said Puddleglum. But mightn't it have been built by other giants, said Jill? I mean, by giants who lived hundreds of years ago and were far cleverer than the modern kind? 
it might have been built by the same ones who built the giant city we're looking for. And that would mean we're on the right track. An old bridge leading to an old city. That's a real brainwave, Paul, said Scrub. It must be that. Come on. So they turned and went to the bridge. When they reached it, it certainly seemed solid enough. The single stones were as big as those at Stonehenge, and must have been squared by good masons once, though now they were cracked and crumbled. The balustrade had apparently been covered with rich carvings, of which some traces remained. Moldering faces and forms of giants, minotaurs, squids, centipedes, and dreadful gods. Puddleglum still didn't trust it, but he consented to cross it with the children. The climb up to the crown of the arch was long and heavy. In many places, the great stones had dropped out, leaving horrible gaps through which you looked down on the river, foaming thousands of feet below. They saw an eagle fly through under their feet. And the higher they went, the colder it grew. And the wind blew so that it could hardly keep their footing. It seemed to shake the bridge. When they reached the top, could look down the further slope of the bridge, they saw what looked like the remains of an ancient giant road stretching away far before them into the heart of the mountains. Many stones of its pavement were missing, and there were wide patches of grass between those that remained. And riding toward them on that ancient road were two people of normal, grown-up human size. Keep on, move towards them, said Puddleglum. Anyone you meet in a place like this is as likely as not to be an, em an enemy, but we mustn't let them think we're afraid. And by the time they had stepped off to the end of the bridge and onto the grass, the two strangers were like close. One was a knight in complete armor with his visor down. His armor and his horse were black. There was no device on his shield, no banneret on his spear. The other was a lady on a white horse. A horse so lovely that you wanted to kiss its nose and give it a lump of sugar at once. But the lady, who rode side saddle and wore a long, fluttering dress of dazzling green, was lovelier still. Good day, travelers, she cried out in a voice as sweet as the sweetest bird song, trilling her R's delightfully. Some of you are young pilgrims to walk through this rough waste. That's as may be, ma'am, said Puddle Glum, very stiffly and on his guard. We're looking for the ruined city of the giants, said Jill. The ruined city, said the lady. That is a strange place to be seeking. What will you do if you find it? We've got to, began Jill, but Puddle Glum interrupted. Begging your pardon, ma'am, but we don't know you or your friend. Silent chap, isn't he? And you don't know us. And we'd as soon not talk to strangers about our business, if you don't mind. Shall we have a little rain soon, do you think? The lady laughed, the richest, most musical laugh you can imagine. Well, children, she said, you have a wise, solemn old guide with you. I think none the worse of him for keeping his own counsel, but... I'll be free with mine. I have often heard the names of the giantess city ruinous, but never met anyone who would tell me the way thither. The road leads to the burr and castle of Harfang, where dwell the gentle giants. They are as mild, civil, prudent, and courteous as those of the Ettendmore are foolish, fierce, savage, and given to all beastliness. And in Harfang, you may or may not hear tidings of the city ruinous. But certainly you shall find good lodging and merry hosts. You would be wise to winter there, or, at the least, to tarry certain days for your ease and refreshment. There you shall receive steaming baths, soft beds, bright hearths, and the roar and the baked and the sweet and the strong will be on the table four times a day. I say, exclaimed Scrub, that's something like. Think of sleeping in a bed again. Yes, 
and having a hot bath, said Jill. Do you think they'll ask us to stay? We don't know them, you see. Only tell them, answered the lady, that she of the green kirtle salutes them by you and has sent them two fair southern children for the autumn feast. Oh, thank you. Thank you ever so much, said Jill and Scrub. But have a care, said the lady. On whatever day you reach Harfang, that you not come to the door too late. For they shut their gates a few hours after noon, and it is the custom of the castle that they open to none once they have drawn the bolt. How hard ever they should knock. The children thanked her again with shining eyes, and the lady waved to them. The marsh wiggle took off his steeple hat, steeple hat and bowed very stiffly. Then the silent night, and the ladies started walk, walking their horses up the slope of the bridge with a great clatter of hoofs. Well, said Puddleglum, I'd give a good deal to know where she's coming from and where she's going. Not the sort you'd expect to meet in the wilds of giant land, is she? Up to no good, I'll be bound. Oh, rot, said Scrub. I thought she was simply super. And think, hot meals, warm rooms. I do hope Harfang isn't a long way off. Same here, said Jill. And hadn't she a scrumptious dress? And the horse! All the same, said Puddle Glum. I wish we knew a bit more about her. I was going to ask her all about herself, said Jill. But how could I when you wouldn't tell her anything about us? Yes, said Scrub. And why were you so stiff and unpleasant? Didn't you like them? Them, said the Wiggle. Who's them? I only saw one. Didn't you see the knight? asked Jill. I saw a suit of armor, said, the, said Puddle Glum. Why didn't he speak? I expect he was shy, said Jill. Or perhaps he just wants to look at her and listen to her lovely voice. I'm sure I would if I were him. I was wondering, remarked Puddle Glum. What you'd really see if you lifted up the visor of that helmet and looked inside. Hang it all, said Scrub. Think of the shape of the armor. What could be inside it except a man? How about a skeleton, asked the Marsh Wiggle with ghastly cheerfulness. Or perhaps, he added as an afterthought, nothing at all. I mean, nothing you could see. Something invisible. Really, Puddle Glum, said Jill with a shudder. You do have the most horrible ideas. How do you think of them all? Oh, bother his ideas, said Scrub. He's always expecting the worst, and he's always wrong. Let's think about those gentle giants and get on to Harfang as quickly as we can. I wish we knew how far it was. And now they nearly had the first of those quarrels which Puddle Glum had foretold. Not that Jill and Scrub hadn't been sparring and snapping at each other a good deal before, but this was the first really serious disagreement. Puddle Glum didn't want them to go to Harfang at all. He said he didn't know what a giant's idea of being gentle might be, and that, anyway, Aslan's signs had said nothing about staying with giants, gentle or otherwise. The children, on the other hand, who were sick of wind and rain and skinny fowl roasted over campfires and hard, cold earth to sleep on, were absolutely dead set to visit the gentle giants. In the end, Puddle Glum agreed to do so, but only on one condition. The others must give an absolute promise that, unless he gave them leave, they would not tell the gentle giants they came from Narnia, or that they were looking for Prince Rillian. And they gave him this promise, and so they all went on. After that talk with the lady, things got worse in two different ways. In the first place, the country was much harder. The road led through endless narrow valleys down which a cruel north wind was always blowing in their faces. There was nothing that could be used for firewood. There were no nice little hollows to camp in, as there had been on the moor. 
The ground was all stony, made your feet sore by day, and every bit of you sore by night. In the second place, whatever the lady had intended by telling about Harfang, the actual effect on the children was a bad one. They could think about nothing but beds and baths and hot meals and how lovely it would be to get indoors. They never talked about Aslan or even about the Lost Prince now. And Jill gave up her habit of repeating the signs over to herself every night and morning. She said to herself at first that she was too tired, but she soon forgot all about it. And though you might have expected the idea of having a good time at Harfang would have made them more cheerful, it really made them feel more sorry for themselves and more grumpy and snappy with each other and with Puddle Glum. At last, they came one afternoon to a place where the gorge in which they were traveling widened out, and the dark fir woods rose on either side. They looked ahead and saw they had come to the mountains. Before them lay a desolate, rocky plain. Beyond it, further mountains capped with snow. But between them and those further mountains rose a low hill with an irregular, flattish top. Look, look, cried Jill and pointed across the plain. And there, through the gathering dusk, from beyond the flat hill, everyone saw lights. Lights! Not moonlight, not fires, but a homely, cheery row of lighted windows. If you've never been in the wild wilderness day and night for weeks, you will hardly understand how they felt. Harfang! cried Scrub and Jill in glad, excited tones. <gasps> Harfang, repeated Puddle Glum in a dull, gloomy voice. But he added, oh, hello, wild geese, and had the bow off his shoulder in a second. He brought down a good, fat goose. It was far too late of reaching Harfang that day, but they had a hot meal and a fire, and started the night warmer than they had been for over a week. And the fire had gone out. The night grew bitterly cold. And when they woke the next morning, their blankets were stiff with frost. Never mind, said Jill, stamping her feet. Hot baths tonight! That's the end of chapter six. Well, much has happened in this chapter, even though probably... According to Puddleglum and the children, it's been day after day of a monotonous march through worse and worse lands. They traveled over that tall bridge with the thoughts, and it seems like a good one. That maybe it's related somehow to a, an ancient ruined giant city. They've met a beautiful woman and a mysterious knight, all clad in black. And the beautiful woman has given them some very interesting information that there are gentle giants up ahead in a, a homely house where they can expect to be treated as welcome guests, where they can find the hot baths and hot food and soft beds that they are so craving right now. It's been weeks now of this camp out march and sleeping on hard cold ground and eating very little and probably always being a little bit wet and a little bit dirty and a little bit cold and maybe a lot a bit miserable. Just the hopes of a homely house has them both excited but in its own way extra miserable because now they have something to look forward to. Instead of being an inspiration all it's making them do is feel sorry for their current condition and now they can't wait to get out of what they're doing. And here's where I think the dangerous temptation is. They are now so focused on getting out of the hard, cold journey and into the house of the gentle giants, nothing else seems to matter. Did you catch that where Jill has stopped repeating the signs of Aslan? They don't even mention his name anymore, or even the prince. Why they're there in the first place, all they can think about is getting out of the cold, getting out of the wilderness, and getting back into a nice warm home and a nice soft bed. When everything else that you know is important has fallen aside to a singular goal, I think you have to be extra careful right then that you are not falling to a temptation to be focused 
not just on one thing, but quite possibly the wrong thing. They're there for a reason, a critical, essential reason, a quest. Don't let your circumstances so bog you down. Don't let the temptations be so sharp that you lose sight of what you ought to be doing in the first place. Maybe Puddleglum's dour disposition has a part to play in this yet.